continuing our study in, uh, in Romans here, 18 through 25, and this is part three of Creation Set Free. Uh, the majority view on this text, I think you're aware, is that Paul is talking about the physical creation. Everybody says that, that's what Paul's dealing with here. He's dealing with the planet, so to speak. And most believers uh, see this text as talking about the, the physical planet being made better. God's going to redeem the planet. He's going to reverse the curse. And I don't, you know, we've been talking about that, and I just don't know what's going to get better out there. Are the, you know, grass going to get greener? The sky's going to get bluer? Rocks are going to be not as hard? I don't know what, you know, what exactly, you know, they're talking about, but they look forward to that. Um, they, cause, it's because they see the planet is under a curse. And we talked about last time that I don't believe that God cursed the planet. He cursed man. You know, he, he put a curse on him because of, the sin. Well, let's look at this text again together and then we'll uh, start our exposition. Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creature waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creature was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creature itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth, to childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Now you, as I've said in the last couple studies that we've done on this, I see this text talking about Israel, the creation here, the creature is Israel. Believing Israelites... The Greek word here, katesis, that occurs 20 times in the New Testament. It can be translated either creature or creation. Sometimes it's talking about individuals. Sometimes it is talking about the planet. So you have to search the context and find out what's he talking about. We're going to do that today. Hopefully, you know, I can help you to see that this is not talking about a planet. It's talking about people. Uh, we've said I don't see that our physical world is under a curse. Jesus didn't die for animals or bugs or plants or rocks. So, you know, if there is a curse, I don't know how, who's going to free us from it. God told Adam that he would die in the day that he ate. That's the curse. And he did die. And the death had nothing to do with anything physical. He died in a spiritual relationship with God. He was separated from God. And this passage is all about Israel, not physical creation. N.T. Wright <clears throat> states this. The whole creation, sun, moon, sea, sky, birds, animals, plants, is longing for a time when God's people <clears throat> will be revealed as God's glorious human agents. You think the sun's really up there saying, man, I just can't wait. I can't wait till the sons of God get revealed. You think the moon, you know, I just don't, <clears throat> I just don't understand this, you know. <clears throat> Later, Wright says, Paul never says that creation itself will have glory. It will have freedom because God's children have glory. And what you have to understand in this text is the creation and the sons of God, they're connected here. And the things that are happening are happening to them both at the same time. It doesn't say, you know, the, the creation longs for this and the manifestation of the sons of God. And then later, a couple thousand years later, something else is going to happen. And what right and so many fail to see in this passage and not only in this passage, in the whole Bible, are the time statements. You know, we have that little saying about preterism, it's about time. That is so true, that is so right on, because it is about time. You have to understand what time it is. It's a good Sunday to talk about time, time change Sunday, you know. You have to know what time it is. <clears throat> Look at the time statement here in verse 18. This is where Young's really helps because you can't see it in the other translations. 
He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory about to be revealed. The glory about to be revealed is not in our future. This was written 2,000 years ago. It was in their near future. It's 2,000 years past for us. And since this was about to happen, it must not be talking about the physical renovation of the planet. If it was about to happen, whatever happened, happened. Or we have a problem with inspiration. Giving us the futurist view of this text, John MacArthur, you know i got to use John, okay? He's my favorite because he's, so, he's such a popular speaker and popular writer, and a lot of people lean, and he gives us the dispensational view here of this text. Look what he has to say. It's a little lengthy quote here. He says, God never changes. I agree with him on that. <clears throat> but this creation is going to change. I don't agree with him on that. It is really going to change. There's going to be a glorious restoration. There's going to be a regeneration. And I'm not talking about the new heavens and new earth. That's after the millennial kingdom. There's going to be a change before that. Jesus says there's coming a regeneration. And when it comes, I'm going to be on my throne. He's not saying he's. He's talking about Jesus going to be on his throne. And we know that the prophet... I don't think he's talking about himself. <laughs> the prophet said he'd be on the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. And not only is he going to be on his throne... He's going to rule the nation of Israel. And not only is he going to rule the nation of Israel, but the twelve apostles are going to sit on the twelve thrones and assist him in judging the twelve tribes. That's the regeneration. That's the promise of the regenerated earth, the kingdom where Christ establishes his throne and reigns. This is the promise of God. One of the features of the millennial kingdom is, of course, you have these believers taken to glory both New Testament believers and Old Testament believers, all taken to glory, given glorified bodies, they come back to earth to reign with Christ, and they're all resurrected individuals with a glorified body like the resurrection body of Jesus. Just keep that little thought in mind. The resurrect, we're going to have bodies like Jesus. We're going to talk about that in a minute. The restored earth exists for a thousand years, so God's going to renovate the planet, after which the whole thing is totally, I love the, way, the language here, uncreated. It's like he can't say destroyed. God uncreates it. Okay? So for, God's going to recreate the earth only for a thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, he's going to uncreate it. Uh, uncreate. And God creates a new heaven and a new earth. At that point, all that has been recreated is utterly uncreated. <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> he says the elements melt with fervent heat, probably talking about the reversal of the atomic creation that God put into motion in six days, and it's all uncreated. Then God creates a new heaven and a new earth. That, people, is a pretty good summary of dispensationalism. I mean, that's, that's what they believe. But here's the thing. What does the Bible say happens at the end of the millennium? So he says we've got this thousand years and then he's gonna, God's going to uncreate. So he's just going to fix it for a thousand years. Then he's going to destroy it and start all over. What happens at the end of the millennium according to the Bible? One thing it says is that Satan is destroyed, right? Revelation 20, verse 2. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. All right, so at the beginning of the millennium, Satan is bound. Revelation 20, verse 7 says... When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. So at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released. Then watch what happens in verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now here, the final destruction of the devil and his demons is recorded as being thrown into the lake of fire. Now this is, happens before the New Jerusalem which is the new covenant, is seen coming down out of heaven. Now notice what Paul says in Romans about Satan. Remember, MacArthur saying this is happening at the end of the thousand years. You know, the millennium ends. Well, at the end of the millennium, the Bible told us Satan will be destroyed. Look what Paul says about the destruction of Satan. In Romans 16, writing to the Romans, he says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. 
Now, the Greek word here for crush, suntribo, means to crush completely, to shatter. Paul said here to the Roman Christians that he was writing to in the first century that it would happen soon. Takos. And according to Art and Gingrich lexicon, takos is used in the Septuagint and certain non-canonical writings to mean speed, quickness, swiftness, haste. So Paul says Satan's going to be crushed soon. The Bible says this happens at the end of the millennium. Now, soon could not be a thousand years, I don't think. If it's a thousand years, then it doesn't mean anything, really. Let me show you what Paul, when Paul talks about soon, let me show you how he uses the word. Philippians 2.19. I hope to send, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. Takos, okay? So that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. So he says, I want to send Timothy to you, same word, takos, and I want to do it soon. How soon? Well, he says in verse 23, therefore I hope to send him immediately. As soon as I see how things go with me. I think Paul's saying here, as soon as I hear the outcome of my trial, I'm going to send him to you. Very soon. So you'll know how things are going. They were concerned about Paul. He wanted to keep them informed. So he's going to send Timothy just as soon as he knew the results. This happens soon to the first century. So how do we make this be thousands of years? See, it's about time. We have to notice the time statements that God put in the text. Soon can't be a short time in, you know, writing, I hope to send him immediately. As soon as I hear, I'm going to send him. Soon can't be a short time and be a long time. Okay? That violates the law of logic and the law of contradiction. It can't be A and not A at the same time. It can't be soon and real long. It just, then it means nothing. All right, we've gone over verses 18 through 20 in the past couple of weeks, so I'm going to actually move on to verse 21 this morning. And I think verse 20, 21 is kind of loaded as far as giving us some idea clearly of what Paul's talking about in this text. He says that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now we've seen that the creation in Romans 8 is not referring to the physical cosmos, it's a reference to the believing remnant of Israel. It's referring to old covenant saints who were under law and were in bondage to sin and corruption. He says they will be set free. The words set free are from the Greek word eleutherao. Eleutherao. And it means to set at liberty. And basically it's used to be set free from the dominion of sin. The future passive verb implies that God will do the work of liberation within the context of declaring it as a fruit of Jesus Christ's redemptive work on the cross. Eleutherao is only used seven times in the New Testament. All in relation to Israel being set free from the bondage of the law. So you need to trace all its uses and see how is this word used it is never used of a physical planet getting any kind of... It's always used of Israel, which gives us an indication, hey, guess who Paul's talking about here? It's used in John 8. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in Him, He's talking to Jews, if you continue in My Word, then you are truly My disciples of Mine, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. el u Same word. Truth's going to make you free, He says going to set you free from what? From the law, from that bondage. That's what he's talking about. Look what he says a couple verses later, verse 36. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free. el uh Indeed. Romans 6, 18. And having been freed, el uh we saw this when we studied chapter 6. He's dealing with the believing Israelites in this context here. He uses it again in verse 22. But now having been freed, el again. In 8.2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. el He's referring here to the bondage you just talked about in chapter 7. Remember when Paul cried out, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Speaking of the bondage to the law of sin and death, he says, it's going to set you free. 
Look at Galatians 5.1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. El Eutherav. Paul says that they are not to be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Now, he says don't do it again. It means they were under it. So Paul's talking in Galatians to the Jewish believers and he said, you've been set free. You don't need to go back under that law again because the temptation was to go back because everyone's telling them, yes, you, it's, Christ is important. You need to believe in Jesus Christ. But you also must be circumcised and you also must keep the law. And they're trying to bring them back under that law. And he says, you don't have to do that. What does he mean, the yoke of slavery here? Well, it's easy to figure out if you just look at other texts, how he used it. Peter uses this in his speech at the Jerusalem Council. Look what he says in Acts 15.10. Now therefore, why do you put God to the test? By placing upon the neck of a disciple, of the disciples, a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. See, to compel the Gentiles to adopt the Mosaic law as a means of a right standing with God was to tempt God by putting the Gentiles under a yoke that the Jews never could bear up to. The yoke is the law. It's a yoke of slavery because it places them under the burden of the commandments that they cannot keep. So every use of Eleutherao refers to Israel. It's never used of the planet being set free from anything. So I think he's telling us very clearly in this text what he's talking about. Notice the word slavery in Galatians here. Galatians uses our word, then he uses the word slavery. This word slavery is the same word used in our text. So there's two words in this text that are in our text. Let's go back to ours and look at the slavery here. This word slavery is from the Greek word douleia. It's only used five times in the New Testament. And guess what? It's only used of Israel. It's used in Romans 8.15, 8.21, Galatians 5.1, and Hebrews 2.15, and it's used in Galatians 4.24. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants. One proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves, she's Hagar. The slaves are those under the law, which would be the Israelites. So again, this word slavery, douleia, is connected with Israel and their slavery to the law of sin and death. And then he uses the word corruption in our text. It's from the Greek word phora. It's only used eight times in the New Testament. Again, always dealing with the corruption of sin and the law. So again, this word here is connected also with Israel. Peter uses it, 2 Peter 1.4. For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Who's Peter writing to? He, he tells us in, in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, he's writing to the diaspora. He's writing to the tribes, the ten northern tribes that have been scattered throughout. So he's writing to Jews. All right, <clears throat> so, that, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So he's talking to Jewish believers here, and he tells them you escaped the corruption of the law of sin and death. So Paul is telling us that creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption. Speaking of the creation here, <clears throat> or being set free, he uses the word eleutherao, and then he talks about slavery, and he uses the word dolea, and he talks about corruption, and he uses the word thora. And they're all tied to Israel and the bondage of sin and death. All of these words are used for Israel. Now, why would he do this if he's talking in this text about a physical creation. Do you think he's trying to confuse us? In other words, I'm talking about the planet, rocks and trees and birds and bugs, but I'm going to use all these words about Israel just to see if I can confuse you. He's not trying to confuse us. We're already confused. Okay, We don't need any help. He's trying to make it very clear that the catesis is Israel. Everything connects to Israel. Then Paul goes on to say that they will be delivered into the freedom 
of the glory of the children of God. The creation, the remnant of Old Covenant Israel will share the same freedom of glory as the children of God. It's not the physical creation sharing glory of the children of God, but the believers of the Old Covenant. So these two groups, Old Covenant believers, New Covenant believers, they're sharing this together. The writer of Hebrews talked about that. Look at what he says in Hebrews 11, chapter on faith. He says, all these Old Covenant believers, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. They didn't get the promises? No, they didn't get the promises because they hadn't come yet. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So believing Old Covenant Israel died in faith, hoping for the promises of what? What was the promises that Old Covenant Israel waited for? What was Israel's hope? Resurrection. That's what they waited for. Look what he says in 11.35. Women received back their dead by resurrection. And others were tortured, not accepting their release, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Better than what? What's he mean to resurrection? Well, women received their dead back by resurrection. And others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. The one's physical. The other one is better. It's a spiritual resurrection. All right? And God didn't give Old Covenant Israel deliverance in advance of the New Covenant saints. They waited. Look what he says in 11, uh, 39 and 40. All these having gained approval through their faith, again, the Old Covenant believers, did not receive what was promised, the resurrection. Because God had provided something better for us, a watch, so that they, apart from us, would not be made perfect. See, God providing something better for us, that's New Covenant saints, so that apart from us, New Covenant saints, they, Old Covenant saints, would not be made perfect. The text says that they did not receive what was promised. Well, what was promised? Well, it, the resurrection was promised. And prior to the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, it was a promise. It was a future hope, not a present possession. The promise of eternal life, resurrection, life in the presence of Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. That's the promise they had not received. He said, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Per perfection here, people, consists of being raised into the presence of God. Dwelling in God's presence. It's receiving their e eternal inheritance. The Old Covenant saints didn't receive their resurrection until the church was perfected. Prior to A.D. 70 and the return of Christ, nobody entered the presence of God. The creation, the Old Covenant believers received what was promised right along with the children of God. The creation received eternal life. They were resurrected into the presence of God at that time. Together. And that's what's happening in our text they're together looking. The creation's longing. The New Covenant believers are longing, waiting for that promise. Notice what else Paul says about the creation. In verse 22, he says, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. The whole creation. This is all the righteous remnant of Israel. All of them groaning. Creation here can't be the planet because he talks about this groaning. He talks about the creation groaning and he talks about new covenant saints groaning. Now, you got to say the one for the planet would be metaphorical because rocks and trees and don't really groan. So that's metaphorical. But the, the new covenant believers are literally groaning. So you got metaphorical, literal, used of the, the same word for two different things. And it, that's a bad hermeneutic, people. You just can't do that. Yeah, the creation was metaphorically groaning, but the, the New Covenant believers, they were physically groaning, and he uses the same word, and we're going to do it in two different no directions. No, that just, that's not a good hermeneutic, people. It's not a good way to deal with the text. <clears throat> it might make your theology fit better with the text, but it's not good hermeneutics. He says the whole creation suffers the pains of childbirth. This is all from the Greek word, Sunodino. And it means to suffer in pain together. The Jews believed, 
that just before the manifestation of the Messianic kingdom, Israel was going to go through a period of intense suffering. William Barclay says, Time was divided by the Jews into two great periods. This present age and the age to come. That's it. They only saw two ages. And that's all the Bible talks about, two ages. The present age is wholly bad and beyond all hope of human reformation. It can only be mended, it can be mended only by the direct intervention of God. When God does intervene, the golden age, the age to come, will arrive. But in between the two ages, there will come the day of the Lord, which will be a time of terrible and fearful upheaval like the birth pains of the new age. The phrase pains of childbirth is an image that sometimes in the Scripture is simply used to express great pain. But very often, it's used of a woman in the pain of childbirth. And the imagery became known as the, they called, the Jews called it the Messianic birth pains. It pictured creation being brought forth into this new existence. In other words, something new, the idea of birth pains is there's a lot of pain, but it's giving birth to something. Something's happening through these pains. The process of this birth would be finalized with the coming of Messiah. And we see that in Isaiah 26. We also see it here in Micah. He's, in Micah 4.9, it says, Now why do you cry out loudly? Is there no king among us? Or has your counselor perished? That agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth. So you got this pain going on. Writhe and labor to give birth. We're, we're in pain, but because something is happening. Writhe and labor to give birth. Now watch what he says. Daughter of Zion. Like a woman in childbirth. For now you will go out of the city, dwell in the field, and go to Babylon. Watch. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. This Redemption is a resurrection. And they're giving birth to something new is happening. So again, we see this idea of Israel as the one who is in labor pains. All these terms that Paul used were connected with Israel. Because Israel is the creation. Birth pains is almost always used as a special term of the birth pains of Messiah. It speaks of a period of distress preceding the coming of Christ. It, its use here seems to be expressed, express, chosen to talk to us about these birth pains that are giving birth to something new. Now, let me show you something that you might not have thought. Maybe you have, but this is kind of interesting, I think. Some see the birth pains here connected with Genesis 3.16. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he'll rule over you. That kind of gives me chills, because this could be a prophecy about Israel. Giving birth to the sons of God, and Jesus being the husband, ruling over his church. Remember, this is the proto-evangelum here in this text, the, the gospel being proclaimed ahead of time. Paul says, we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And this is not our now, it's their now. The first century now. we got to understand, again, time, 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 everywhere Paul's giving us time indicators that seems so many people want to totally ignore. Let's look at verse 23. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. <coughs> Excuse me. We ourselves. This is the New Testament saints. Paul and his audience. Not only this, but we ourselves... We have the first fruits, he says, of the Spirit. Now, it's likely that this expression of the Spirit is, called an, is what is called an appositional genitive, which would render it in English the first fruits, which is the Spirit. 
As we saw earlier in our study of chapter 8, the Spirit was given as a pledge, which is the Greek word erabon. Erabon means a pledge, a purchase money, a down payment, so to speak, uh, an engagement ring, a security that the rest is going to come through. And that's the idea here. We ourselves have in the first fruits of the Spirit. We got the down payment. It's a guarantee God's going to do what He promised us He was going to do. <coughs> this word first fruits to the Israelites would have had some great significance. God commanded the Israelites to present a portion of their harvest um, that ripened first as an offering to Him. Exodus 23.19, Nehemiah 10.35. This offering acknowledged that the whole harvest was from Him and really belonged to Him. It was an offering that the Israelites made in faith, confident that the rest of the harvest would follow. Similarly, God's gift of the Spirit to the first century believers is a pledge that He's going to complete this process of salvation. We see that throughout the New Testament, that the salvation is coming forth. They haven't quite received it yet because they're in the transition period. And until the Lord returned, salvation was not complete. John Piper writes this, Because of Christ's purchase redemption, believers already receive the Holy Spirit. This is like a down payment of our full redemption. But it is only the first fruits, a foretaste. Our salvation is not finished. Now he's writing our as in our, you and my, and he's missing the time statement again. He says it's only begun. We're saved only in hope. This is true morally. Paul says in Galatians 5, 5, we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Our, he says, a down payment or our full redemption, talking about believers today. Our salvation is not finished. We are saved in hope. See, his mistake here is he sees us as living in Paul's day. Now, you know, that's a, that's a simple mistake, I think, for a new believer, but for someone who's been teaching the Word of God for 50 years, I think you ought to have some understanding of time statements, okay? And you have to understand that those New Testament writers wrote in a transition period, and they're not talking about us. He sees us as still waiting for the adoption of sons. Listen, the same adoption of sons that was about to happen 2,000 years ago. So it's about to happen, and it's still about to Any time now. <clears throat> I mean, seriously, people, how long can people keep saying it's soon and we keep going, yeah, it is soon? This is what's called newspaper theology. You pick up the Bible and you say, look what God sent me today. Back up a little and look who it was written to. I don't think there's anything in there to the saints at Tidewater. That would be cool. Of course, if it's like Philippians and he calls out some people in the congregation, maybe that wouldn't be so cool, you know? <laughs> Yodi and Syntyche, get together, ladies. Be on the same mind. Oh, those ladies must have said, oh, dang, on, you got to get personal here in the, you know, in the congregation. He, 2,000 years later, Piper sees us, we're still waiting. John MacArthur writes, we have possession of the past elements of salvation. The present elements of salvation... See, these guys will all take salvation and divide it into three tenses, past, present, and future. The reason they do that is because they understand that's what's happening in the transition period. They just don't understand we're out of the transition period. Okay? He says, but not yet future elements. We don't have the future elements. Now, then he, he's going to tell us that he's right because he's going to quote a scripture. All right? And the scripture is going to back up what he's saying, and it does if you live in the transition period. He quotes this scripture, Romans 13, 11. Do this knowing the time. Oh, I wish people would. <laughs> he says that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. And they'll say, see that? Your salvation's getting near. Wait, didn't he write this to the Romans? Wasn't their salvation getting near? Ours is getting near too? Again, these words just have no meaning. The now here, knowing that the time is already for now, he says. The now is in the first century. Our salvation is not near. It's here. How can now be to reading, writing to the Romans, how can you write now 
And then 2,000 years later, people say, look at that. Now, wait a second. Salvation was not a completed event in the lives of the first century believers. It was their hope, but they looked forward to its soon arrival. It's coming soon. This, this process is winding down because the end of the age is coming, and it's very near to us. They just ignore all the time text. They ignore audience relevance, people. This is basic hermeneutics 101. Audience relevance. Who was the original audience that this was spoken to? Have you ever read a letter or read, a, I guess today, an email or a text and not knew who it came from? <clears throat> and, you know, don't you get the context all screwed up? About two weeks ago, I got a text in the morning. Da, 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 and I'm looking, and I looked, and it didn't have the name on my phone, so I didn't know who it was from. But I knew the area code. So I said, that's Las Vegas. I said, that's got to be Bill. Okay, so I'm, I'm texting back and forth, back and forth. You know, and finally I say, thanks, Bill. It's been real encouraging. And I get back, LOL, this is not Bill. It's John Array. And I'm like, I've been carrying on this conversation thinking it was Bill. You know, it helps to know who you're talking to, doesn't it? And I felt like, well, I'm an idiot. Well, she lives in Vegas too. So <laughs> I guess, you know, I just, no, well, Bill's in Vegas. Must be Bill, but it wasn't. So you got, I mean, audience relevant, that's basic, people. But I'll tell you what, if you can just get people to understand audience relevance, you got it made. I mean, really. That's where I start with people who don't know anything about preterism. Start with audience relevance, okay? Because that's where, if they can get that down, when you read the Bible, figure out who's he writing to, okay? Figure that out, and then understand the time period that he wrote in, and then you, you, it's going to give you a whole different picture. Because really, we read it like it just came in the mail. Look at this. I just got this today. Soon. He's coming soon. That's how I read it as a new Christian. Look at it. It says soon. Never thinking about <laughs> Gosh, he didn't even write this to me. All right. So he's, MacArthur quotes this scripture here. And this is his proof that salvation's... But look at the next verse. The night is almost gone. It's almost gone. Just a couple more thousand years and it'll be over, okay? The day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So he equates their salvation with the day, which is referring to the new covenant. The night here is the old covenant. The night is almost gone. We're living in a day, he's telling them, that the night is about to end. And the day is very near. So MacArthur's verse doesn't carry a lot of weight when you put it in the proper context. Paul says that the first century saints were groaning. Look what he says, the first fruits of the even we ourselves groan. This is the Greek word stanadzo, and it's the same word that Paul used in 2 Corinthians 5. And I want to connect these two texts. We've connected these many times, but you've got to understand... Because most people, even preterists, are off on this text. All right? Look at it. For we know that if our earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down. So many people take this. This is referring to the body. I'm not talking about your body. This is a covenantal context. Go back to chapter 3. Start getting the context. It's all about old covenant, new covenant. And he says, if the earthly tent is torn down at that tabernacle, that Old covenant is torn. We have a building from God, a house that's not made with hands, that's eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house, we groan. Under the old covenant, there's a burden. People say, oh, I'm groaning in this body. You might be, but it has nothing to do with this text. Longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. And so much as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For while we're in this tent, we groan, being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed. We don't want to just get away from the old covenant. We want something to be in. So that which is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Again, the context of this passage, I think, makes it so clear. If you start reading the chapter 3, when you get to 5, you'll understand what's going on. All right? This isn't, you know, take the chapter divisions out. 
Start at 3 and just read through. They were groaning under the persecution for the cause of Christ. And they were looking for redemption. And Paul's telling him, hang on, because it is close. It is soon. People, when you are, we see this throughout the New Testament, this groaning, this, you know, and so many texts, Paul's telling him to hang on because the answer's coming soon. The Lord's going to return soon. And people say, yep, that's 2,000 years ago. If that's true, what did it mean to these people? Let's say you're in pain. <clears throat> you know, when I called the hospital yesterday to talk to Sandy, I could hear Bob groaning because he was in such pain. Now, if the doctor came into his room and said, don't worry. Because in a couple thousand years, we'll have some new medicine, and you won't even feel this anymore. What's he going to say? Well, he probably, if he had the ability, would grab the doctor and choke him. I don't care about 2,000 years from now. I want relief now. And to say to these New Testament saints, hang on, because God's going to bring the answer here. In 1 Peter, he talks about, you know, the Lord's coming. He's going to give you relief from your suffering. I mean, how sick to say to somebody who's in pain, hang on, because it's real soon, but not really. A couple thousand years, but we'll tell you it's soon. They were waiting eagerly, he says. Again, this is the Greek word apodekomai. The composite word speaks of an attitude of intense yearning and ear waiting for the coming of the Lord. Every use of this epic decamai is of the coming of, the, the coming of Christ. It implies it's going to happen soon because they're waiting, they're looking, they're longing. Where is this relief? We're groaning. We want some freedom from this situation. This Greek word is used three times in our text. In verse 19, it says, The creation eagerly waits. Here in verse and in verse 25, it's the first century saints who eagerly wait. And their wait would soon be over. That's the whole point. Your wait's going to be over soon. Paul was saying they were eagerly waiting for our adoption as sons. Now, to see the connection with Israel here, again, we've seen everything in this text lines up with Israel. Well, so does adoption. Whose was the adoption? Well, Paul's going to tell us in the next chapter, 9 4, he says, Who are Israelites? To whom belongs the adoption as sons? That's theirs. And the glory. And the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, the promise, it's Israel. The adoption belonged to Israel, and the new, true Israel, the church of Jesus Christ, is receiving the promises because we are the fulfillment of Israel. <clears throat> then Paul says, our adoption as sons, that is the redemption of our body. Full manifestation of adoption is identical with the redemption of the body. We could translate this, our adoption as sons, that is the redemption of the body. It's the first time the word redemption is mentioned since 324. And redemption should remind us of the Exodus theme that runs all through this passage. God is redeeming His people, this time not from Egypt. He's redeeming them from the law of sin and death. And it's the body is about to be redeemed. The redemption of the body in this text is the resurrection. All right, I haven't found anybody that questions or disputes that. Tom Constable writes, the redemption of our bodies is the resurrection. S.L. Johnson writes, we groan waiting for the adoption that is the redemption of our body, the resurrection. All commentators that I have read, not all commentators, because the ones I haven't read, I don't know what they say, but all the ones that I've read connect this with the resurrection. They say that the redemption of the body is the resurrection, and I agree with them. This is talking about the resurrection, but I disagree with them that it's talking about a bodily resurrection because they all throw that in there. This is the bodily, bodily resurrection. John MacArthur writes this, We are waiting not for the redemption of our souls. That has already been done. We're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. I want a new body. I want to get rid of this fallen flesh with its tendencies toward disease, death, and sin. I want to get a new body. And it'll be like the body of Jesus Christ. I want to get rid of this fallen flesh. I've said to you over and over, that's Gnosticism. The body is evil, the spirit is good. That's Gnostic. There's nowhere in the Bible that teaches the body is bad. 
okay? The body didn't fall, man fell, okay? Man as a whole fell. It's not like this part of me is bad. If I just get rid of this, I'll be a good person. <clears throat> he says it's going to be like the resurrected body of Christ. Keep that in mind. I want to talk about that in a minute. S.L. Johnson writes this. There's a struggle then for the Christian as long as he's in the flesh until the resurrection of the body. Then we'll receive a body like our Lord's own glorious body. In other words, the only reason we have problems now is because we're in a body. As soon as we get out of it, as soon as we get a new body, everything will be good. It's going to be like Jesus' body, he says. Piper writes this. <laughs> this is a... Follow with me on this quote from Piper, okay? Men and their imaginations. I, I love it. He says, This is the promise of a redeemed body when glory replaces groaning. The promise has at least three parts. He says, first of all, all pain and disease and deformity and disability will be gone. Okay? And focus on that word deformity there. Okay? You won't have any more deformities when you get your new body. All sin, which so often takes the body for its base of operations, will be gone. All this is not because we will be rid of our bodies, but because in a mysterious and wonderful spiritual way, we will have new and glorious bodies, which are capable of touch and smell and taste and hearing and seeing. You will have the best body imaginable. There will be playing and climbing and swimming and running and jumping and swinging and skiing and roller skating and Timmy skateboarding and biking and hiking and bowling and tumbling and hopping and whatever else you do that makes you very, very happy. Seriously? Could I get some scripture with this? Where's the skateboarding scripture? Where's the hopping scripture? Where's any of this scripture? That we're, a body was going to be capable of touch and smell. Where, where is the scripture to back any of this stuff up? Scripture, don't confuse us with that. We just, yeah, that's good stuff. They all say we're going to have bodies like Jesus' resurrected body, right? Let me ask you a question. Does that mean we're going to have the deformities of this life? Because Jesus did. Didn't his body have scars from the cross? The crucifixion? How is that a new glorified body that's all perfect when you got holes in it? So I'm missing something here, okay? I don't want a body like that, okay? That's not the ideal body. I mean, if you've got a deformity, then you're going to have it. You're going to have still your deformities like Jesus did? The traditional view of resurrection that is held by most of the church is this. When a believer dies, their body goes into the grave, their spirit goes to heaven to be with the Lord. They're in a disembodied state waiting the resurrection at the end of time. Then at the end of time, the Lord returns, resurrects all the decayed bodies of the dead, puts them all back together, and on the way up to heaven, He changes them into spiritual bodies. I'm like, why put them together? And change? There's a lot of processes there going on that I don't know what they're for, okay? He changes the physically resurrected bodies into spiritual, immortal bodies like Christ. That's pretty much what the church teaches. That's probably what you've heard most of your life. This is basically what the church teaches on the resurrection, but isn't what the Bible teaches. See, it's interesting to note that the Bible never uses the terms, you ready? Resurrected body. Now find that in Scripture. Here's another one you won't find in Scripture. The resurrection of the body. You ever been questioned by somebody and you say, well, it's got to be in there somewhere, right? <laughs> well, find it, Okay. And you'll never find the term physical resurrection. Now, I guess I should be a little cautious saying this because some of the new translations out, I don't know what in the world they say, you know. They could say some crazy stuff, but these are not in the Greek text, okay? These terms. Now, that may surprise you. The church uses these terms quite often. The Bible never does. Let me give you some biblical phrases about resurrection. These are the ones that the Bible does use. The resurrection of the dead... Nothing there with body. And the resurrection from the dead. All right, so in order to understand resurrection, you have to understand death, right? Resurrection is resurrection from the dead, and the death that you're resurrected from is the death that Adam brought. Now, what did Adam bring? Did he bring physical death? Most people see, seem to think he did. I don't see that. I don't see he brought. God didn't say, you know, he, God said, 
in the moment you do it, you will die. And he died. He was separated from God, but he lived physically 900 and some years. So <clears throat> I don't see physical death as connected with the fall. Some people do, I understand that. But look at 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since by man came death, that's referring to Adam. Adam brought death, right? By a man also, that's Jesus Christ, came the resurrection of the dead. All right, so whatever Adam brought, Christ fixed. Now, if Adam brought physical death, Christ fixed it, believers should never die physically. But he didn't, that, that the, the thing that Adam brought was spiritual separation from God. He lost fellowship. So the thing that Christ fixed was the fellowship problem. Nothing to do with physical. It is not a physical resurrection. It is a spiritual resurrection. The resurrection is bringing man back into the presence of God. The Bible nowhere teaches a physical resurrection. Now, if you know your Bible... You might be thinking, doesn't Job somewhere in there teach about a physical resurrection? Doesn't Job say something about that? Look at what Job says. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, who I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see and not another. My heart faints within me. Okay? Yet from my flesh. Now, that... Job's looking for the fulfillment of the promise of the resurrection. And many see this as Job saying, it's going to be physical. Look at from my flesh, I will see God. And that's what it says. The problem is, that's a bad translation. And Kyle and Delich, who are not preterists, okay, they translate verse 26 this way. And after my skin, thus torn to pieces, and without my flesh shall I behold Ella. Without my flesh, they say. In their commentary in verse 26, Kyle and Delich write this. We cannot in this speech find that the hope of a bodily recovery is expressed. Thank you for some honest exegesis. It disagrees with their theology, but they're being honest with the text. Thank you. So the Bible does not teach a physical resurrection, but it does teach the time of the resurrection. See, people teach what the Bible does and, and don't teach what the Bible does. It doesn't talk about a physical resurrection, but it tells us a lot about the time. See, the Scripture testified that the time of the resurrection was to be at the end of the Old Covenant age, which to us, gone, right? Look at Daniel 12, 13. But as for you, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion when? At the end of the age. All right, he's telling you at the end of the age, not the end of the world, but the end of the age, the end of the Jewish age. We know this happened in AD 70 with the destruction of the Jewish temple. And the disciples knew that the fall of the temple and the destruction of the city meant the end of the old covenant age. The inauguration of the new age. Notice what Paul says about the resurrection. Acts 24, 15. Having hope toward God, which they themselves also wait for, that there is about to be, this is Young's, there's about to be a rising again from the dead, both righteous and unrighteous. In the first century, Paul says this resurrection is about to happen. The New American Standard translates the words here, shall certainly. But this is the Greek word mellow. And whenever mellow in the present active indicative is combined with an infinitive, it's consistently translated about to. So Paul told his first century audience, guess what? There's about to be a resurrection from the dead. So the timing of the resurrection from the first century was soon. The old covenant was coming to an end. Paul says it's about to happen. Does that tell us anything about the nature of the resurrection? It must be spiritual. It's about to happen. It happened at the end of the Old Covenant. Time defines nature. The body talked about here is not 
our individual physical bodies. And that's the problem. Everybody says, well, you know, our body's going to be redeemed. We're going to get a new body. And we get into all this stuff that we've already seen that's you know, fanciful and not biblical. The word our here is plural. It's a corporate term. Our, all of us together. Paul's talking to the Roman Christians. Our body, body is singular. So all of us get a body. Wow, we all got to share a body? That could be, that's like Sybil, right? We got all these people stuck in one. This is talking about the corporate body of Christ. Now some translations have the word bodies here, plural. Such as the NIV. The re, NIV says the redemption of our bodies. That just aids in the correct, incorrect thinking. But what Paul says is body, not bodies. Now listen to what N.T. Wright says. N.T. Wright in this book in Romans, commentary on Romans says, Paul uses the singular body. Okay, he recognizes that. Rather than the expected plural, as in verse 11. Now watch what he says. But there seems to be no particular significance to the change. So he's honest with the death. I mean, Paul says body, singular, but ah, don't worry about it. Plural, you know, singular. Paul just got confused. He didn't know. You know, I mean, come on. You know what? You're wrong, right? <laughs> right is wrong. Okay, there. There is significance. Paul and the Holy Spirit used the singular because that's what they meant. You shouldn't play with the text. Let the text play with you, maybe, but don't play with the text, all right? Adjust yourself to, to fit up with the, what the text says. We can't do that because we get bound in tradition. We get locked into a framework and we say, I know it says that, but I'm going to figure out a way to... And that's what he says. And Wright is a, a guy who understands the corporate body. But see, he sees this text as future. So guess what? He's got to keep it in my theology, theological framework there. This is referring to the body of Christ, the redemption of our body, that body of Christ. This is what he talked about in 724. This is Christ's body that was to be redeemed at the parousia. See, these first century saints were being transferred out of the body of Adam into the body of Christ, but the body of Christ needed to be redeemed because as of yet, they still were in that dead state of separation from God. They hadn't been brought into His presence. This is the eschatological, eschatological redemption that Paul spoke about in Romans 7.24. This is those who have trusted in Christ being brought into the presence of God again. What was lost in the garden is now fixed. Man lost the presence of God. He lost that relationship to God. This, at this time, now when this happens, this is the fullness of salvation. This is eternal life. And this happened 2,000 years ago. This text has nothing to do with physical creation. It's talking about the fullness of salvation that happened at the end of the Old Covenant period. Our body is the body of Christ and it has been redeemed. You and I now are in the presence of God. We don't look for it. We don't hope for it. We don't wait for it. We have it. We're going to look in the next couple of verses some other time, not today. That Paul talks about hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. Well, we have it. We see it. We are in the fellow, we are in fellowship with God. He dwells among his people. We have access to God 24-7. We are his body, his redeemed body. And we dwell in his presence. No more waiting. All right, I know I'm spending a lot of time on this text, but I think it's really important because this is a stronghold for futurism. See, the planet hasn't been redeemed, so y'all are wrong. You got me there, I give up. I mean, come on. You know, I love, I love looking for new arguments against preterism because, you know, I'm like, well, I first used to look for it when I became a preterist. I spent a lot of time reading every argument against it because I wanted out. Okay? <laughs> I wanted to be normal again. <laughs> but, you know, now I like being abnormal. There's a lot of neat people that are not normal. Okay? So I'm with a good crowd, so I'm not looking so, but I still read all the objections because I like to hear what other people say. But you see, read something new and you're excited, oh, let me see what they say, and I read it, and they go, we know the Lord hasn't returned because just look up. The sun and the stars are still there. I'm like, oh, you got me there. Throw in the towel. What a strong argument. I'm like, come on, people. All right. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I thank you this morning. 
for your word. And, and my prayer, as always, is, Lord, make us Bereans. Father, give us a hunger to know the truth and to adjust our lives according to it, Father. May we submit to you, Lord. Submit to the text, allowing it to change our views, to alter whatever it is we hold, that we would line up with you. Lord, I pray that you would give us the heart of Brians as we go over this text, that we would truly search it out for ourselves. We would study and dig to see if these things are so, Lord, and then adopt them for our own. Lord, I thank you for this morning and just the opportunity to be together as your family. We love you. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.